to hear another uh, reading of Lifeboat uh, 12. Hope you're all doing well and enjoying this time at home um, with your parents and your other siblings. Uh, I know these are hard times, but you know what? We're going to get through it and we'll be so much more thankful for school when it starts up. And I really love the comments you guys are all making on the journals and you're all encouraging each other, all positive comments. So that's so nice to hear. The one thing I do want to say is if you can somehow get your pictures to just go in your individual boxes, that would be great. I'm loving all the pictures of your, your pets, but some of them are way too big. So if you can just keep them uh, into your little journal uh, box, that would be great. So as you remember, our main character, Ken, 13 years old, is on this lifeboat raft with, um, what do we say, 46 other people. They only have enough food and drink to last them eight days. Um, they're all cold and it just sounds miserable. So um, let's keep going. I noticed some of you had uh, put in some uh, predictions about what you thought was going to happen in this story. Some of you thought that they would um, get um, rescued. Uh, some of you thought it might take them a while. Um, so I'm really interested in hearing your prediction after today's reading. So let me know what you're thinking. This is called If Only. If only I could move a little, stretch my stiff legs. Ooh, jinx, says Billy, when I kick him his shin by mistake. Sorry. With 46 people, there are elbows in your back, knees in your side, feet in your face. There's no room to move from your little confined space. I shift in my seat and think of my bike back home. Oh, I love to ride that bike. Pedals pumping, coasting. It felt like freedom. Dad got it for me at the allotment field. One of the wheels had buckled, so someone chucked it. Dad said, here, you can mend that. And so I did. We kids made our own fun, or we didn't have any. I made my go-kart out of old pram wheels that Terry and I would Terry and I would fly down the street past the rag and bone man. If only Terry were here, if only I knew where he was, whether he was safe. Do my parents know what's happened? Is anyone thinking of me? I remember Terry's drawing of me, staring halfway out to sea. Was that really just six days ago? Different languages and our seating arrangements form three islands in the boat. British staff in the stern, Laskers in the center, Father O'Sullivan, Mary Cornish, and Mr. Nagorski sitting with us children in the bow of the boat. Two men are bridges between us. Only Gunner Harry Pern and Ramjan Bukso are nimble enough, nimble enough to move carefully about the boat knowledgeable enough to translate the different languages aboard. Butso and Purd act as ambassadors, messengers, negotiators. Blast, explodes Purd. Hurry that food along, Purvis. These poor little blighters are half starved. Ambassador, yes, but unlike Butso, Purd is no diplomat. I notice one of the younger Lascars with the start of a mustache I envy sitting just on the other side of Miss Cornish. He talks and talks to his mates, but I can't understand what he's saying. He notices me looking at him. I notice he looks thirsty, tired, and cold. I smile at him. It means me too. He smiles back. We can't talk to each other, but we both understand. Up in the bow, we tell stories to pass the time. I was trapped in my cabin after the torpedo hit, says Father O'Sullivan. Derek and Billy pulled me out. You boys are already in heaven. Meaning they burned their way to heaven because of how they helped Father O'Sullivan. But Derek and Billy hardly smile. All they talk about are their little brothers. Did anyone see Peter? asked Billy. Or Alan? asked Derek. They were in the infirmary when the torpedo hit. We don't know what happened to them. I'm sure they're all right, says father. The nurses probably got them into another lifeboat, I say. 
We promised our parents we would look after them, says Billy, swiping his eye with the back of his hand. Everyone says Derek and Billy are heroes for saving Father O'Sullivan, but they don't think so. Her heroes don't lose their little brothers. No matter what we do, we're sitting in water most of the time. Bail with your hands like this, I say. Cup them and toss the water overboard. <clears throat> So cold, says Derek, clamping his hands under his arms. May we have the bucket, I ask? Jobs, everyone, everyone lean to this side. The grown-ups join in. We tilt the boat a bit and pull the water into the bucket and toss it overboard. There, it's working. We've almost got it all. Then a big wave slops over the side of the boat. Whoosh! And drenched to the bone, we have to start bailing all over again. The salt water eats at our feet. Derek, Billy, and I, lucky enough to have shoes, falls in sandals. Fred and Howard are barefoot. My feet are cramped with cold, but their feet turn white, then red, then blue. They shrivel as they do with too much time in the water. Look at these boys, yells Gunner Purd, picking his way down the boat. Four little rotters, shouting and cursing about women who don't know about children and men who pray too much. Purd wraps a blanket around Paul's, Fred's, and Howard's feet. They gaze up at him, astonished. Purd is bad-mannered and bossy, but he does get the job done. Did you want to go, Paul asks. I jolly well did, says Howard a proper London lad. My parents warm, warned me about the torpedoes, but I wanted to see a ship and I meet and meet real Navy men. Huh, no one warned me about the torpedoes. I was over the moon to go, says Fred. I couldn't wait to ship out, but my mom kept hanging on to me. It was like trying to get away from an octopus with all her arms. Even my dad had a few tears in his eyes. But I couldn't wait. No octopus hugs for me. My mom said we had to go because we're part Jewish, says Derek. One of my great grandmothers ran off with the Jewish sailor, I think. The Germans hate anyone with a Jewish connection, you know. Don't know why. Mom cried when we said goodbye. But no tears from my mom. My parents made me go, I say. My stepmom finally figured out a way to get rid of me. The boys looked up, startled, searching for something to say. So I changed the subject. What about you, Paul? Did you want to go? I begged my parents to go to Canada, he says, to get away from the bullies at my school. I got the application myself and had my sister talk my mom into it. My brother was going to go too, but he chickened out. I say, why stop in Canada? Why not sail the world? You want to live on a ship, I ask him. I don't think so, says Fred. Remember when we were seasick on the ship? Remember when the torpedo hit, Paul? I had to wake you up. He sleeps through anything. Paul looks down and studies the cut on his foot. I look up at the sky and wonder if my mom who died, is there in heaven watching over us. My hands and legs start to tingle with pain, numb from cramped quarters and the cold. Ugh, it prickles and burns, I say. Ken, dear, let me rub your hand and feet, says Miss Cornish with a kind smile. It will help get your circulation going. I stiffen and blue and blush with awkwardness at her touch. This lady I barely know, but she's so gentle and her hands are so warm. I soon feel better. She moves on to the next boy. Her eyes look tired, but she keeps working to make sure we're all okay. Miss Cornish doesn't have any children, but she would make a good mother. Harry Peard has seen enough of sadness and hurt. He picks his way to the bow, belting out naughty sea chanties to make us laugh. Miss Cornish scowls at his songs in disapproval. But Purr gives us a grin. No use sulking, boys, he shouts, standing up, stripping down to his shorts. 
Miss Cornish turns away. With a stretch and a leap, he's over the side of the boat. He's down! He's gone! With a gasp, we grasp the rails and lean over, looking for him. Where'd he go? I shout. His head pops up, sputtering, laughing. He's gone for a swim. Where are you going swimming, mister? asks Howard. To keep in practice in case we get torpedoed again, says Purd with a wink. He's a proper screwball, he is, said Fred with delight. Come on in, lads, he calls. I love swimming, I say. Ignore the man, says Miss Cornish. I can tell the adults think Purd is a little crazy. He climbs aboard laughing, rocking the boat. I think he's grand, simply grand. Mary Cornish frowns at Harry Purd, dripping water in the boat. He glances, us up at, he glances at us and scowls back at her. I hear you're just a piano teacher, he says. Now my wife, she's got a way with kids she has. Keeps them fit as fleas and stands no nonsense neither. I look at Miss Cornish. Uh-oh. I see her pull herself up, but Peard won't stop. What do you know about kids, he asks her. Got none of your own, nor likely to have any either. Well, you're right on both counts, says Miss Cornish, staring back with her wise brown eyes, tucking her dark hair back with her slender white hands. And what of it, she asks. They stare at each other for a few seconds. No offense, of course, says Purd, finding his way back to a seat. We boys look at each other surprised to hear adults having an argument, allowing children to hear. Harry mutters about Miss Cornish, but she rubs our cold feet, asks us questions, suggests us to sing a song. And we sing. Uh, it does us all good singing to pass the time. Yes, Purd calls Mary. Yes, Purd calls Mary spinster under his breath with scorn in his eyes, but we call her Auntie Mary because she takes care of us. What do you do when there is no loo, no privacy, and nothing to do but go to the bathroom over the side of the boat? Remember, a loo is like a bathroom. I learned the shipboard wisdom of not going to the bathroom in the wind. Lovely. And there's a bucket passed down from hand to hand. Who needs it now? Asks the sailors, busy with bailing. We boys circle Auntie Mary, facing away when it's her turn to use the bucket. She takes care of us, and we take care of her. We need a flag, Cooper says, in case we see a ship or a plane. We need something to wave to send a signal to save us all. But there is no flag. Auntie Mary turns, slips inside her jacket and thin silk blouse, slips inside her jacket and thin silk blouse and pulls out her chemise. Use this, she says. A chemise is kind of like a, a slip. The boys and I stif stifle ourselves and the men turn as pink as our new flag, but Signalman Mayhew shinnies up the mast and ties it to the top. Rally round the flag, boys our small pink flag. Harry Purd's open mouth closes. Well, I'll be, he says. At six o'clock, our first supper of our long day one comes down the line. Another ship's biscuit, a sardine, another dipper full of water, a tin of condensed milk shared by six of us. The milk is sweet but it kind of makes us thirstier. And I hate sardines, yuck, but I'm hungry, so hungry. We say grace before and after our meal. Father, I say, the prayer lasts longer than the meal itself. After supper, we face a second long night aboard lifeboat 12. It's cold, blooming cold. I shiver under my wet coat and stare out at the waves, rocked by the questions in my head. Where is the 